Hi, I'm John Mather, Nobel Prize Laureate and Senior Scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope at NASA, and you're listening to The Soul of Life. You're sitting on four and a half million pounds of explosive fuel. You're riding a big fireball. That's dangerous. You know, anybody who doesn't think that launching on a rocket is dangerous shouldn't be on top of a rocket. The James Webb Space Telescope, decades in the making, finally launched from Earth recently and promises to unlock some of the deepest mysteries of the universe. Who better to speak to about this milestone in astronomy than astronaut veteran of five space flights and former NASA science administrator, John Grunsfeld. James Webb will hear right through that gas because the infrared light escapes and see those stellar nurseries where baby stars are being born. As part of a long career with NASA, John Grunsfeld became known as the Hubble Telescope's repairman, logging more than 58 hours in five spacewalks and three repair trips to the Hubble before being the last person to touch it in 2009. We talk about the risks of spaceflight. On Hubble, you didn't have any place to hide out like you could on the space station. And for that reason, we had a second space shuttle. We flew Atlantis. Endeavor was available uh, in case we had to be rescued. And I asked John how he felt about flying in the space shuttle after the second total crew loss in the 2003 Columbia accident. The weakness of the shuttle, which we've always known, is the heat protection. You're enveloped in a 2000 degree plasma. If that thermal protection system is penetrated, then you know, it's a very bad day. Would we solve the environmental crisis that we face if world leaders had the chance to see the Earth's fragile bubble from space the way John has seen it? Over the course of five space flights, flying around the world many, many times, other than occasionally over the open ocean, everywhere that you look out the window, you can see evidence of humans changing the Earth. We talk about how human emotions play a role in scientific research bias and the astonishing speed of technological development of the last 200 years. There's no guarantee that the human brain has the capability to understand the universe. We've gone from living in caves and being early agrarians to being able to intellectually model uh, what we think the universe is down to the subatomic level and remarkably so. And finally, I ask this NASA insider for the honest truth about UAPs. If I were an alien who had thousands of years of lifespan and could cross those vast distances and came to Earth, I'd want to go to the Louvre in Paris and see the world's great art. I wouldn't just zip around trying to avoid or tantalize you know, a few military aircraft. By the way, if you love astronomy, you'll want to also listen to my interview with Nobel Laureate and Science Director for the James Webb Telescope, John Mather, in season one. Welcome to The Soul of Life. I'm Keith Miller, and this is astronaut John Grunsfeld. It's really unfortunate that Leonard Nimoy didn't survive to this time. What an experience it would be if both Shatner and Nimoy could go on the same mission. I'm Keith Miller, and my podcast, The Soul of Life, is here to help you remember who you really are. I'll bring together people who have gotten off their treadmills. I'll have conversations with athletes, musicians, doctors, scientists, healers, and entrepreneurs to discuss the fascinating edges of our knowledge in neurobiology, psychology, and physics. This is The Soul of Life. Former astronaut John Grunsfeld is a veteran of five space flights in the NASA Space Shuttle program from 1995 to 2009. He's logged more than 58 days in space, including 58 hours and 30 minutes of extravehicular activities, EVAs, and eight spacewalks. He visited the Hubble Space Telescope three times as an astronaut to service and upgrade the observatory. John retired from NASA in December 2009 and served as deputy director for the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, managing the science program for Hubble and its partner in the forthcoming James Webb Space Telescope. He returned to NASA in 2012 as the Associate Administrator of the Science Mission Directorate at NASA HQ in Washington until his retirement in 2016. John Grunsfeld, welcome. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks. I appreciate being on your show. Thanks so much for being here today. I'm I'm super excited to talk to you about a lot of things. It's not every day that you get to talk to an astronaut, and uh, especially someone like you who's been called the repairman for Hubble. Um, you've been there 
more than any other people? Is that is that true? Well, cer- certainly in space. I think there are people who spend a lot more time with it on Earth. Uh, but once we deployed it to orbit, I've got the most time up close and personal with the Hubble. The last time that you 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 gave it sort of the the farewell kind of touch as you were the last one to leave it there. I know a lot of scientists don't get very emotional about equipment and tools and that sort of thing. But, you know, Hubble has really struck a chord for us humans. Uh, it's, it's data. It's more than data. It's given us a, a window into into who we are, maybe, perhaps. Um, what was it like to to leave it at that time? You know, before the flight, you know, I wondered, first of all, I was, I felt so privileged to be able to go back a third time. You know, I'd spent so much of my life uh, training to upgrade and repair the Hubble. Uh, two flights prior, you know, working on it, bringing it up to up to date. And I think, as you know, between uh, the fourth and fifth servicing mission, uh, you know, in 2004, NASA announced it was not going back to the Hubble. And so, you know, we thought, well, you know, now we know what the end of Hubble will be. And then it got put back on the manifest and I got assigned to go with it with a great crew. Uh, so I was just so privileged to be able to go back again. And I wondered, you know, am I going to be really sad, you know, when we deploy the telescope and I see it, you know, drifting off into the distance for probably the last time humans will ever see it. And when the, the actual time came, uh, we had done so much work on the telescope over the course of five days, uh, in, including some work that uh, wasn't planned in the original timeline, but we got done anyway with some new insulation, that by the time it was, you know, that moment for me to give a little pat and a salute to the Hubble, uh, I wasn't sad at all. I thought, you know, we've done everything we could to bring Hubble the best scientific instruments available to humankind to repair the things that were broken uh, and to send it off in the best shape really of its entire life uh, that, you know, I thought, you know, we've achieved something really substantial here and really great uh, and proud that we were able to do all that work. And in fact, that's been borne out. Uh, we thought we would extend the, the mission lifetime of Hubble of maybe five years, maybe 10 you know, and here we are 12 years later and Hubble is still going strong. And it has another, you think, many years to go, even though other telescopes are getting put out there. The James Webb, we'll talk about that later and, and others, but does it have more time left? Well, certainly the science that Hubble does uh, is unique. And if it can last another five or 10 years, uh, scientists will make you know, tremendous use of it. There's no, really no way to predict how long Hubble will last. Uh, as you know, last June, Hubble was, was not operating for about a month. Um, while we tried to figure out, you know, something that looked like a potential computer glitch or a memory problem and turned out probably to be in the power system, uh, which we replaced in 2002. Um, fortunately, the engineers who operate uh, and technicians who operate the Hubble uh, are really brilliant, and they were able to, you know, get down to really the, you know, the details of of how the electrons are moving and every software switch, and found a fix. And Hubble's back and operating, so it's you never know, uh, but there's every possibility that Hubble will last till the end of, end of this decade. Right, right. Y- you flew on the shuttle after the 2003 uh, Columbia tragedy. It was the second total crew loss. Of course, the shuttle program um, it came into question after that, but other missions went, and you went also after Columbia back in 2009, many years later. What was it like, John, for you to get back into the shuttle after, I mean, of course, years later, but still, as we know, trauma, there was deep, deep trauma for NASA, for our whole country, for for people when I visited Cape Canaveral and and saw the memorial. I, I was just overcome. You know, it's it still brings up strong emotions for people. What did your family say to you? How did you feel and, and deal with those emotions getting back into the shuttle? Well, it's certainly true that it uh, it changed my perspective. You know, I I vividly remember uh, when we lost Challenger. I was a graduate student uh, at that time and an aspiring astronaut. Uh, and you know, I think space exploration is something that's really important uh, and worth risking human lives for. And then personally, uh, I felt that it's risking worth risking my life for, especially when it comes to uh, 
the pursuit of science and knowledge and Hubble in particular. Um, I feel like, you know, Hubble is so remarkable, so important to, you know, our understanding of, you know, our solar system, our universe, that it's, you know, it's worth risking my life for in addition to just the raw adventure. Um, but the loss of Columbia, you know, first of all, you know, there are personal friends on board. Uh, and it also changed the perspective that, you know, we kind of expect that during launch, you know, you're sitting on four and a half million pounds of explosive fuel that over the course of eight and a half minutes, you're going to expend that that's, you know, you're, you're riding, you know, a, a big fireball that that's dangerous. You know, anybody who doesn't think that launching on a rocket is dangerous shouldn't be on top of a rocket. But with the loss of Columbia on entry, uh, you know, change our perspective that, you know, the, the weakness of the shuttle, which we've always known, is the heat protection. And it's pretty remarkable that you can take, you know, a uh, 100 metric ton, you know, 220,000 pound brick uh, that looks kind of like an airplane and smash it through the atmosphere so that you're enveloped in a 2000 degree plasma and survive. Um, and then you know, glide to a landing, uh, really remarkable. But, but if that uh, that thermal protection system is is penetrated, you know, then you know it's a very bad day, as happened to Columbia. And so, going into the mission, you know, we thought, okay, well, launch is dangerous. Now we know that entry, you know, is also particularly dangerous. And that's you know that's why the Hubble mission was originally canceled. And that if we sustain damage, foam damage on the tiles, for instance, that would prohibit us from entering uh, safely. Uh, we didn't, on Hubble, you didn't have any place to hide out like you could on the space station. So all the other missions went up to the space station. Hubble was the sole anomaly. And for that reason, we had a second space shuttle. We flew Atlantis. Endeavor was available uh, in case we had to be rescued, and we practiced that. Although, in, you know, in reality, you know, it may or may not have worked. Uh, but it, you know, so pre-flight, you know, we talked to our families that, hey, the mission really isn't over till we step out of the shuttle, you know, on the runway uh, at the end of the mission. Um, but my my family knows that I'm passionate about spaceflight and even more so about repairing Hubble. Uh, that, you know, there wasn't any question about, well, should I go or not? Uh, you know, once once I was assigned. You know, I was pretty determined. I, I could imagine, and it's and, and such an honor to be able to to do that. And and you spent your career, John, studying science, astrophysics. Before that, as a scientist, um, speaking of that drive that you have to be able to put yourself on the line like that in those situations, as a kid, what was it like for you to imagine? I think you said you've always wanted to do this. Is that is that really true? Uh, it's mostly true. I, for the first six years of my life, I'm not really sure you know, what I wanted to do or think or thought about it. But, but around six years old, I was determined to become a, a, a truck driver. Uh, partly because when we'd go to the grocery store, you know, we'd walk by the back of the grocery store and there were these big trucks and, you know, people driving them in and out. And I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and then uh, my family got a television and we saw, you know, images of the Gemini astronauts and then the Apollo astronauts and landing on the moon. And so about Age seven or so, I declared to my mom that I wanted to become an astronaut, and she thought that was great because it might, you know, continue to push my interest, nascent interest in science and math, along. And there's no chance I'd ever actually become an astronaut, so she didn't have to worry. <laughs> uh, and it was really not, you know, like a super drive uh, where I made life decisions as I went into you know high school and college. Uh, just in the back of my mind, I thought. Well, by the time I'm, you know, a college graduate and a PhD astronomer or whatever I become, everybody will go to space. Well, that didn't quite happen, um, but I did get to go into space and and pursue my passions. Speaking of everybody going into space, William Shatner, who is 90 years old, I, I find that hard to believe that he's that old. When I when I look at the old Airplane Two uh, footage of him, classic movie, um, he's 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 so young. Scheduled to go to space on Blue Origin tomorrow, uh, October 13th, for people listening to this later. What advice do you have for William Shatner about space flight? I'd say, that, you know, the, the important thing is for him 
to uh, not really fool around a lot, which is hard to do in terms of floating in the cabin because it's a unique feeling uh, to be able in true free fall, even if it's only for a few minutes, and really spend his time at a window, uh, you know, sucking in all of the the beauty of the earth and the thin atmosphere and, um, you know, try, trying to enjoy the moment because it'll be over quick. W- would you do it, John, if you were 90 years old? Um, I, I've, I've, I'm a fan of uh, the science writer, Mary Roach, and she wrote a book, Packing for Mars, which, which talks about in great detail some of the things behind the scenes that maybe NASA in the 60s, the Apollo missions didn't really talk about, you know, going to the bathroom, how difficult it was if you had accidents and it gets messy up there, um, what you eat, trying to avoid going to the bathroom, that sort of thing. Would you do it? You know, would I do a suborbital flight, you know, having, you know, been in space, you know, many times? Um, and, and the answer is no, I probably wouldn't do that. Uh, and, you know, unless I was there to help others experience something, just because it's, you know, you, you're taking all the risk for a very short, uh, short experience. Now, if you've never gone to space and, and you're somebody who uh, can afford it, you know, I think it's a unique thing to do, but it's it's still kind of a very high priced, high risk amusement ride. And there are many things that I'd like to do. You know, I'd I'd like to climb mountains in the in the Himalaya. Um, you know, I'd I'd like to uh, sail across an ocean still. Um, but the big picture is, I'll feel incredibly lucky if I can make it to ninety years old. It's really unfortunate that Len- Leonard Nimoy didn't survive to this time. Uh, because what an experience and, and an event it would be if both Shatner and Nimoy. It would be unbelievably amazing. Are, are you as, are as, as amazed as I am, uh, as many of us are watching the, the autonomous landing of those vehicles uh, on, a, on an aircraft carrier or a, or, or, or a ship, rather? Um, it seems remarkable to, to be pulling that off. And, of course, commercial space flight is really the new era in partnership with NASA, but also doing it for its own reasons. Um, does that strike you as something that you, you know, would you ever have imagined that private companies would be doing that in, in autonomous vehicles? What, what does strike me though, uh, which is different than the space shuttle, because when you see the space shuttle, it looks familiar. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it has a cockpit, it has wings, it has wheels, uh, comes to a landing. The first time that I saw a uh, new shepherd coming down uh, and it was on video, but just the, the very high velocity that it was heading towards the ground. I thought this is going to be bad. Uh, there's, there's no way that it's going to slow down enough to land. And sure enough, you know, once the rocket lit, you know, it decelerated rapidly and then set down and uh, it was just incredible. Since the sixties, space flight has allowed us to look down and see the world in a way that it was impossible to see before. Right, this this world that is so fragile and has this tiny, tiny cocoon around it that's keeping us alive. Do you do you think it's true that if everybody had the experience of space flight, that somehow we would all be environmentalists, or there'd be no such thing as environmentalists? We'd, we'd all be better stewards. Please take the time now to subscribe to the Soul of Life wherever you're listening. Give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. People often ask, did you know, did my experience in space radically change my worldview? The answer is no. As a scientist, I already knew uh, kind of what was going on. But what I did find amazing is that over the course of five space flights, um, you know, flying you know around the world many, many times, that other than occasionally over the open ocean, everywhere that you look out the window, you can see evidence of humans changing the Earth. And even over the ocean, open ocean, generally. Uh, you can find at least one ship, you know, with a stream of smoke coming off of it or contrails from jets crossing the oceans. And, and so this idea that when you're in space looking down at the earth, you see this pristine paradise of, you know, endless forests and open oceans that, you know, humans haven't modified. You know, that's just not true. You know, if, if, you know, somebody comes across the vastness of space to earth and has never seen it before, they're going to know that there's organisms changing the planet pretty radically. Um, 
because you can see it. You can see the deforestation just about in every place on earth. You can see roads. You can see huge open pit mines, you know, that are really quite beautiful, but, but dangerous. Um, you know, you see smoke crossing, you know, you see cities that are kind of a gray splotch on, on the earth. And then, you know, huge plumes of smoke. I mean, we're talking hundreds of miles wide crossing the oceans. And so I don't, I don't want to say doom and gloom, but it, it's clear that, that we are changing the planet. There's no doubt about that. Well, you, you mentioned uh, if somebody came from somewhere else to, to view our, our planet, right? You're, you're making me think about, you know, is anybody else out there? And you've spoken a lot about that as, as a sort of a, a theme throughout your, your career in life, wondering like so many astronomers do, you know, who else is out there, right? In this vast universe, it seems very likely that there would be some other uh, places like this. And we're searching frantically to, to try to find those places and have found possible, you know, uh, solar systems or galaxies that could uh, host this, but let me ask you a, a funny question, John. Like this, uh, this Pentagon report or the confirmation that the Pentagon did that some people it caught the news cycle for for quite a while and got people thinking a little more. And, and someone like me who loves to show alien movies in my backyard with the guys over the summer, um, you know, I'm not sure I wanted to do that, John. It freaked me out. I was I was literally, and then of course Obama comes out and says, "Yep, there's a big file." We're not sure what these things are, these so-called UAPs that the Navy, and not just our Navy, but other navies are seeing and recording on their cameras and, and LIDAR and so forth. So what's your take on that? We've had UFOs and now UAPs, you know, for years. And it just seems a little inconceivable to me that the only evidence we would have of, of interstellar visitors would be these little blips on, you know, radar screens or infrared screens. And then sort of narrowly focused on just, you know, naval aviators and uh, Navy ships and maybe a few, you know, other oddball ones. You know, if, if I were an alien who had thousands of years of lifespan and could cross those vast distances and came to Earth, you know, I'd want to go to the Louvre in Paris and see the world's great art or listen to, you know, human music, uh, you know, maybe through special, you know, earpieces or, you know, see all of the various animals on earth and, and then meet with world leaders and ask them, you know, why are you trying to destroy the only planet you can live on? Um, you know, I, I wouldn't just zip around trying to avoid or tantalize, you know, a few military aircraft. You know, I think it's really interesting uh, and, and worthwhile that the government is releasing that there are these things. Um, but it's not, to me, it's not compelling. Uh, that that this is aliens, you know, visiting the Earth. I'm I'm glad to hear that. I'm going to sleep a little better tonight, John, because of that. I I was I was uh, I was letting my imagination get in the best of me, but it makes sense what you're saying. But I, I I do think I do think in the next couple of decades we will have the answer uh, to whether there's life in our own solar system, either Mars uh, or, as I said, uh, Europa around Jupiter, which is a huge ocean world, twice the amount of ocean as planet Earth, uh, or Enceladus, maybe a little bit longer. And then with the James Webb Space Telescope, we'll have the first views of, you know, a few rocky planets, atmospheres, uh, to see what we see. And I think, I think that's a huge, huge step. And let's talk about the difference between Hubble and the James Webb. Um, they're, they're very different telescopes, and they're going to be in different places from a, the Hubble being in low Earth orbit, and then James Webb being in this at these so-called Lagrange points or Lagrange point where they don't have to really do much to maneuver to stay in stay place in place but very far uh, away how far away is James Webb going to be going to be and, and what's the difference really what are we going to see well the first difference is that the Hubble Space Telescope uh, is an op basically an, uh, a visual telescope you know it sees in similar wavelength range that our own eyes see. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's been so powerful uh, is that it's the first telescope that has given us a view of the universe with a resolution similar to human eyeballs. And so we can now see the, you know, the great beauty and depth of the cosmos as if we were on the bridge of the Enterprise flying out and looking at the Orion Nebula or going out and seeing the, the galaxies to the edge of the universe. Uh, 
Hubble has a little extra range. It can see in the ultraviolet and the near infrared, um, but it sees you know the colors the way we do. The James Webb Space Telescope moves much farther into the infrared that we can't see, into the mid infrared, and and it was designed to do that originally specifically to look further back into the universe than Hubble can see. Um, because the universe is expanding and the light takes billions of years to get from you know where the universe started to us, uh, because our universe is about 13.7 billion years old, as the universe expands, that light is stretched out. And so the light from earlier and earlier times is more and more red. Uh, so the, the James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared telescope we can't really see any infrared. Um, so the images from the James Webb Space Telescope will have to, of course, be converted for your computer screen into light we can see. Um, so it's going to see things that Hubble can't see is the bottom line, which is good. Now, science has advanced a long way since the original James Webb Space Telescope, so we now know that it's also a great tool for seeing through the dusty environments where planets are forming. So we'll be able to see baby planets and analyze the conditions on how planets form. We'll be able to see the, into the atmospheres of some of the larger exoplanets and study those. Um, it also will allow us to peer into dusty regions that Hubble can't see into. You know, these beautiful, colorful nebula where baby stars are being born, Hubble can't see into it, can see the gas. James Webb will see peer right through that gas because the infrared light escapes and see those stellar nurseries where baby stars are being born. Um, and my favorite is that Hubble will also be able to look at uh, the moon of, of Jupiter Europa and look to see if there are plumes of material coming out uh, in greater detail than, than Hubble can see. Uh, that the Europa Clipper mission uh, in 2030 will be able to fly through. Uh, and see if there's any signs of life. So lots of stuff going on. But the position of the two telescopes, because the James Webb is an infrared telescope, it's sort of sensing heat from objects. And so you want to get away from hot objects. And so the Earth is a hot, hot object. So you want to send it far away from Earth. So it's going to be about a million miles away from the Earth. And then to shade itself from the sun, it has a huge tennis court size sun shield. Uh, so it'll be hiding behind that. And that will allow the whole telescope to get very, very cold, about 40 Kelvin, 40 degrees above absolute zero. And that way it can see, you know, objects, you know, in the distant universe and, and other things that are, you know, not much, wow. uh, it's, not it's much pretty amazing. The telescope itself. So we're getting, we're getting a whole new window into the universe. And I think the most remarkable thing that James Webb will probably discover is something people just haven't imagined yet. We can't even imagine what it would be yet, right? That was probably true of the Hubble. And people should watch. It still holds up the, the IMAX film that you're featured in many times um, that shows, it documents the Hubble's graphic images. And just to get a sense of what you're talking about, these, these star nurseries. Um, John, when John, I spoke with John Mather, the Nobel laureate, and someone you you very well know, um, director of science program for the James Webb Space Telescope, and and he was talking about that, you know, that anticipation of what we're going to find out. We, we don't even know what questions to ask. It's almost uh, inconceivable, but uh, something that uh, people all over the place are looking forward to a great deal of. Well, in particular, going back to those grand questions: Where did we come from? The, the Hubble remarkably has been able to observe back to some of the toddler galaxies in our universe, showing you know galaxies that hadn't really formed spiral structures yet; they were misshapen. Um, but just at the edge of what Hubble can see, and there's still hundreds of millions of years of history that we don't know what happened. We don't know. You know, what the first stars looked like, how galaxies actually started forming, what the shape of, you know, the universe was at that time in terms of the gas and dust. And, and James Webb is going to give us that earliest view. And there's still some controversy about how material went from, you know, this hot gas after the Big Bang into an orderly universe of galaxies. Uh, 
where there are lots and lots of early black holes, you know, massive black holes, or did black holes come later? And of course, black holes themselves are fascinating objects. So we're going to kind of peer through the, the veil that Hubble can't see to understand what, what the earliest universe was like. And, and let me ask you a broader question about science and the way our the way our own beliefs, obviously we're humans trying to do our best to get out of the way of, you know, what the, and let the data lead us or let the instrument tell us what's going on. But, you know, like you said, we have ideas, we have ideas about black holes and, um, you know, basically mythology that we, we concoct theories until we can prove them wrong or right. Um, are, are there any of those you think that, that dominate as far as we think about how black holes are, are working or functioning and, uh, you know, in, are, is our definition of some of these fundamental forces in nature changing in ways that, you know, maybe we haven't be- begun to comprehend, we're not asking the right question. Well, I, I think you hit on what I think is one of just the most remarkable features of the human brain. And, and not only the human brain, but, you know, what you might say is human collective consciousness. You know, you get a dozen, uh, you know, theorists in a room and they start discussing, you know, ideas and not only discussing them, but then encoding them in mathematics on, on whiteboards or blackboards or computers. Uh, I just think it's so remarkable that in a very short period of time, and by very short, I mean, you know, really the last couple of hundred years, we've gone from, uh, you know, either Chinese or Greek or Polynesian cosmologies, which are people looking up at the sky, looking at the earth, and concocting origin stories, um, some of which, you know, are remarkably similar to, you know, modern cosmology. But we've gone from just, you know, uh, living in caves and being early agrarians to being able to intellectually model uh, what we think the universe is, how it works down to the subatomic level, and remarkably so, you know, using accelerators, using, you know, incredibly fine measurements, including observations of the cosmos and putting that all together. Uh, I mean, to me, there's, there's no guarantee that the human brain has the capability to understand the universe. But I think we've done a remarkably good job. I think that's the incredible human story. But there are some gaps. Um, you know, quantum theory, you know, explains the behavior of the very small and, and modern physics has explained down to, you know, the assembly of matter and energy, uh, even the existence of mass and things like that, uh, to a very high degree. And, and that, um, allows us to understand, for instance, chemistry and biology and, and why we behave the way we do. Um, at the very large scale, you know, we can only understand the evolution of the universe and stars and, and the workings uh, through gravitation. And, and it, it's remarkable that early period of the 20th century, you know, when, when many scientists and then folk focused by Einstein came up with gen- general relativity uh, to explain space and time. But still we have that gap between the quantum world and the gravitation world. So there's something missing. And, uh, you know, it could be that we're not smart enough to figure that out, or it could be it's, you know, that the right ideas just haven't come yet. And, and I, I favor the right ideas. And once we figure that out, uh, I think, you know, we're going to have a much greater understanding of the universe. And I think black holes you know, are a good example where, you know, our understanding just breaks down, you know, at these very high, uh, you know, curvatures of space time. And that's telling us something fundamental. Right. And, and I've wondered as a, as a person who, you know, who in my field of really being interested in how consciousness works, how, how fundamental energy moves across the system of the mind and brain and body to create something like conscious awareness. Um, you know, just like there are places in the universe apparently where you can't really observe or just blacked out from because of our angle and because of our location, in the galaxy, et cetera, where our sun is and that sort of thing. But, um, are there are there so called blind spots? It would make sense to me. It would seem like there are conscious blind spots that that the mechanics of our cellular structure and our biology can't quite do. But maybe that's what brings us into AI and you know this 
sort of singularity that some people think we're headed towards meshing with, melding with machine learning? Well, that's, that's a very interesting question. And, you know, it's a point that I make quite frequently when folks start talking about human exploration of space, say astronauts on Mars versus sending robots. And the proponents of robotics say, well, it's much cheaper to send robots. Um, and we'll just make more and more advanced robots. We don't really need to send people. And I like to point out, you know, that at least to date, all, uh, all discoveries are made by humans. The robots don't discover anything. You know, there are tools. Um, and humans are still much, much faster at making those intellectual connections. Especially, you know, when you have a diverse group of people, you know, with lots of different ideas and you work through it and you use the principles of science, you know, you make really important discoveries on a really rapid time scale. And so I'm still convinced that for the next decades ahead, that if we could send humans to the surface of Mars, we'll make the most discoveries uh, and the most significant discoveries much faster than a progression of multi-billion dollar robots over the next hundreds of years. Uh, you know, in, until, uh, you know, we can make, you know, a you know, robotic brain that can achieve consciousness and, and we'll have those same questions. You know, maybe we have to program them in. You know, where did we come from? So that that's a driving question. Are we alone? Well, if we make a robot with consciousness, I guess we've created the answer to that question. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. All I know is that the closer, the more we know about the human mind, which over the last 10, even 15 years is just exponentially grown every year, the more we realize we don't understand a darn thing about it. It's, it's so complex and which is amazing to me. It's pretty complex. It's an amazing uh, gift that we have in this, like, like you said, this planet, our, our, our entire, everything that supports us here. Well, think about the technology we're using right now. You know, the microprocessor that, that's gone into the capability for us to converse uh, literally over the airwaves, um, you know, it's really only 40 years old. Uh, you know, our, our brain has had, you know, hundreds of millions of years of, uh, of time to evolve, to be able to, for us to have this conversation. I, I spoke to a great uh, scientist that you may appreciate, and I want to ask you if you're, if, you, if you're willing to share any books that you're reading in your retirement. What, you know, what does an astronaut read in his, in his retirement? What does John Grunsfeld read? Um, but one book that, I, that caught my attention, it was, uh, it was uh, I am out there on the, on the, end, of, at the, the, the end display at, at the Amazon store, Your Inner Fish, uh, Neil Shubin. And I got the chance to speak with Dr. Shubin and, and, you know, just talking, like you said, about the, the billions of years, millions of years of evolution, not just to create this, you know, the, the chemistry. If you start with just, okay, billions of years to create the, the, the chemistry or the gases to create the chemistry. And then you get to cellular structures and then the soup that just happens for millions of years, not a lot going on, but then simple structures and then a body plan comes out of that. And then, of course, so he t he walked me through, and it was such an amazing conversation. How the apparatus that we're using to talk—you mentioned the computer apparatus, obviously the technology, but just our our facial muscles, our vocal cord muscles, our ear muscles—all can be traced back to the to the, um, g uh, the 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 gill structures of a shark. <laughs> you look back, and you know the, the Great Cambrium explosion and such. As a kid, I used to walk along the lake shore of Lake Michigan where big limestone blocks were dropped for the wave action. And I found trilobites, which are these little creatures that used to crawl around the bottom of the sea. Amazing diversity. And they had incredibly complex eyes. Um, and we're still learning about you know, the, those eyes. And of course, vision is so important to us. Uh, and, and in our evolution, um, I had the privilege of flying a small trilobite up to space with me. It's now at the Field Museum in Chicago, just because of its influence on my curiosity as a kid. But you asked, what am I reading? Um, so uh, not, not, not to pitch a, a particular book, but this is Alien Oceans by a scientist at JPL, Kevin Hand, uh, who's involved in Europa exploration. And it's kind of the story of how he became uh, you know, interested in the search for life in the universe and the possibility that we might find life on an alien ocean such as Europa. And, and that's one of the things that uh, is driving me now is 
if we find life on Europa in our own solar system uh, or signs of life, it's probably an independent origin um, because Jupiter is so far away. Can't guarantee that. Um, but if we find life there and it, and it looks like an independent origin, you know, maybe it doesn't, maybe it's not DNA based light. Maybe there's another way of encoding information. Or maybe it's a quadruple strand instead of a, a double helix, uh, or different different amino acid base pairs. We might one learn something really fundamental about how biology works. Um, of course, the first thing is it means we're not alone. If we find independent life on Europa, it means life is all throughout our galaxy. Uh, that that it's not that hard to start life. But it also we might learn something fundamental, which one can really expand our knowledge of of what biology is. Uh, and two, it might tell us something really important about, you know, how to uh, preserve biodiversity on earth or maybe fight human disease. So it's a really interesting question to me. So that's what I'm reading right, right this minute. Sounds like a great book. I'd love to love to read that. Um, Steven Strogatz is one of my favorite. Uh, he has a great podcast called the joy of X about his, of course, his, his background being in mathematics um, and the, and the, the, the phenomenon of sync, um, in nature that we see. And he pointed out, or one of his guests was pointing out just how random and pretty accidental a lot of the discoveries in science and chemistry have been that, that it's now that we're seeing quantum computers or the potential of quantum computers being able to, uh, cr crunch the data sets necessary to really come up with, well, you know, for example, like these Nobel, uh, the recent Nobel Prize in chemistry was given to, uh, scientists for creating a new catalyst. Like, you know, how would we have ever, it's amazing that, that, that we're, I don't want to say stumbling because those, those are people working very, very hard to come up with these things. But, um, do, do you have that sense also that, that we're, we're working hard, but our data set is so small? We still don't have a complete, un I mean, you talked about the human brain and its complexity. Take something simple, turn sunlight into sugar. Yeah. Right. It's just well, it's a plant. A, it's just a plant. But we still don't have a full understanding of the chemistry of how you do that, how you know a photon of light comes in and is absorbed, and then the, the whole chemical chain. But we're making great strides. But there's something where high-performance computing eventually will be able to model that whole process with all of the right molecules, all of their shapes, how they fit together, uh, you know, how how that process works, that will will transform you know, our lives in a, in a big way once we can do that. And, and that's, just, you know, one tiny example. Just a, a final question, but you know, like you're probably speaking to me from uh, one of your a smartphone, maybe an iPhone and the computing power on that uh, phone. I, I've been amazed by the advance, advancements on this, particularly on the iPhone and the camera, how it's better than my, you know, professional DSLR camera, the, the, the processing power compared to the Hubble. And and the the latest iPhone, whatever it is, sixteen or something, I'm not sure what it's up to now. Do you have a sense of like, is the is the Hubble using some some pretty old uh, processing equipment compared to something you can get in your pocket? Well, the the good news is that the Hubble uh, detector, you know, the, the actual the camera part of it, is still pretty state of the art. Uh, in fact, there there have been some calculations that show that the the Hubble camera on the new wide field camera that we put in uh, is already more sensitive and capable than what will be on the 30 meter telescopes once they're finished on planet Earth. But that's kind of a cheat. And that's because astronomers use uh, a metric called signal to noise. And so to get a big signal, you build a big, really big telescope. And Hubble's not that big, it's 2.4 meters. On the ground, we're going to build a 30-meter telescope. Um, but it, the metric is signal divided by noise. And of course, on the ground, we have the noise of the atmosphere. Uh, and being in space, you get to cheat. And so the Wide Field Camera 3 that we installed in 2009 is basically a noiseless camera. It means that whatever photons come in are from an astronomical object. And so in that sense, it's still state-of-the-art. Now, in terms of you know actual pixels, uh, the biggest camera on, on Hubble uh, is a 16 megapixel camera, which is not that huge by today's standards. I have a DSLR that's a 24 megapixel, 
Um, for home telescopes, you can buy a 60 megapixel camera. And the ones on the ground on big telescopes are, you know, approaching a gigapixel. Um, so, so from that point, but still, you know, Hubble's capability that we put in uh, on the last mission are keeping Hubble pretty much state of the art. Uh, there's, you know, there's still a lot of science that we can do that you can't do by any other means. And that's because we had five servicing missions and on each of those missions, over the course of uh, you know twenty years, we were able to bring the Hubble up to date each time. Uh, if we had launched it in 1990 with those instruments, nobody would be interested in the Hubble. It, it would be, you know, pre iPhone cameras. Exactly right, right. Well, I won't keep you very much longer. What are you doing in your spare time? To to you know, coming from a career flying around in space, all the hours you spent out in actually in outer space, out of the vehicle, compared to, to what? What do you do to, to stay busy? Well, I, you know, I love working you know, with technology. Um, and so I'm working on a number of uh, concepts, design concepts for future telescopes, uh, future instruments to go out to planets and uh, hopefully find life uh, around Jupiter in particular, perhaps Enceladus. Um, and I'm on... Uh, the steering committee, sort of the executive committee for the next planetary science decadal survey, um, which we're finishing up this year and will will be released next year. Uh, One of the mechanisms that we use in the United States for science is we bring together hundreds of scientists once a decade uh, in each of planetary science, heliophysics, the study of the sun, astrophysics, and earth science. We create a kind of not really a guidebook, but a, a compendium of advice for federal agencies, the NASA, the National Science Foundation, uh, U.S. Geological Survey, to, uh, to guide their investments in science. And so I'm involved in one of those. And that's an example where uh, I was expecting a lot of sort of science politics, a lot of discussions of priorities in this. And, and what this is the first decadal survey I've been involved in. It's usually non-government people. And of course, as associate administrator, I couldn't be involved. That would be a, a conflict. Um, so I'm really excited that I'm on this panel. And what I found is that we have 100 scientists and we're kind of you know, operating like a huge you know, human collective brain uh, and talking about what's important and what's not and how you approach things and what kind of science we can do. Uh, what technology investments we should be making. And I'm just you know, really impressed by the process and I, I hope we come out with some good recommendations. And this report, for the first time, is not just a planetary science decadal survey, but a planetary science and astrobiology survey. You know, And so we're moving forward in this quest to answer the question of, are we alone in the universe? And I, I find that very exciting. Very exciting times. I look forward to watching the James Webb launch i'll certainly be watching very cool well such a privilege and a pleasure to talk with you john grunsfeld thank you so much for your time my pleasure keith thanks hey i've started a community for soul of life fans interested in talking about episodes or getting more information about some of my teaching on ifs mindfulness and relationship growth head on over to community.souloflifeshow to get access to this group of really cool people just like you who care about the show and want to talk about episodes or, or hear more, get access to courses and, and support each other through life. That's what this is all about. Please leave an iTunes rating for the show and subscribe now wherever you listen to get more soul in your life. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrum. All right, I will go. 